Welcome everyone. Bonjour et bienvenue à tous. Uh, my name is Victoria Owen and I'm the chair of the Canadian Federation of Library Associations Copyright Committee. I'd like to welcome you to this webinar on controlled digital lending on behalf of the three organizations that are jointly um, sponsoring um, and presenting this session. The Canadian Association of Research Libraries, the Canadian Federation of Library Association, and the Council of Atlantic University Libraries. I wish to thank you for joining us today, and I particularly want to thank our speakers for agreeing to be with us today to talk about this very timely topic. As we start this uh, webinar, I'd like uh, to take a moment to acknowledge the Indigenous land on which we are all situated. So um, I'm speaking to you from the University of Toronto, and it, it operates on the uh, Huron-Wendat, the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. So this, today this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And I encourage you all to take a moment to recognize the traditional peoples and the history of the land on which you live and work. And now we can move on to the main event. I'd like to uh, hand over the, uh, the mic to our presenters. And in this order, you'll be hearing from our presenters today. Chris Freeland, who is the Director of Open Libraries of the Internet Archive. Welcome, Chris. Next, Amanda Wackerock, who's the Copyright Librarian at the University of Alberta. And welcome to Amanda. And finally, to Christina de Castell, who's the Chief Librarian at the Vancouver Public Library. And welcome to you. And now I'll turn it over to Chris to, uh, to begin the presentation. Thank you all. Thank you, Victoria. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, bonjour, uh, je m'appelle Chris Freeland. And that is the extent of my French. Uh, let me share my screen here. Uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to, to talk with you this morning about uh, controlled digital lending. To give you a little background, uh, I'm the director of the Open Libraries program at the Internet Archive, and I am a librarian. I, uh, uh, before joining the Internet Archive, I was an associate university librarian at Washington University in St. Louis, which is where I uh, live and where I'm coming to you from today. Um, and uh, also acknowledging the indigenous peoples of the area in which I reside. Um, those were the Missouri and the Osage uh, tribes. Um, uh, to, uh, to, to move to the topic uh, at hand today, I'd like to describe a little bit about, uh, give you some background about the Internet Archive. So the Internet Archive is a nonprofit library and we provide access to millions of books, free books, movies, software, music, websites, and more. Uh, you're seeing here our headquarters in San Francisco. Um, the Internet Archive was founded, uh, for those of you that don't know, by Brewster Kale in 1996. And we started our collection by archiving websites. And Brewster and his team saw that that early web was vanishing before our very eyes, that it was being rewritten. Um, you, and those of us who remember using the web in those days, uh, we saw lots of those 404 page not found errors. And so Brewster and his team began crawling the web and archiving that content. And those web archives are now available for users to search via the Wayback Machine at archive.org. And that work began our, uh, kicked off our mission of providing universal access to all knowledge. Then after establishing web archiving, in the early 2000s, the Internet Archive began scanning books that were in the public domain in the, in the United States. Uh, um, today, that is, books that were published in 1924 and earlier. I started working in collaboration with the Internet Archive um, during, during those early book scanning operations because I was the technical director of a project called the Biodiversity Heritage Library which was scanning that public domain literature from scientific organizations, natural history museums, and libraries around the world. Um, uh, you're seeing here in front of you, this is Lon Zhu, who is one of the uh, scanning operators in our San Francisco Scanning Center. She's using the custom developed scanning equipment uh, called the Scribe that we developed to digitize books. And so what you're seeing is that there are two cameras overhead that take pictures as the operator raises and lowers the plate glass, working through the book to digitize it. Um, and this is the way that we digitize all of our books. And uh, uh, importantly, our book, our scanning is non-destructive. Um, and so we have 
preservation copies after we've uh, uh, of the physical materials after we've digitized them. Um, and we have um, scanning operations that are embedded in the US and Canada and the UK, including um, at the Boston Public Library, University of Toronto, and the Wellcome Trust. Um, those scanning operations, by the way, have been impacted by COVID-19 um, and the um, uh, because of the, the libraries that are closed where we are uh, embedded and we're um, starting to, to move back into some levels of operation. We also have a physical library. Um, we've built a lending library of more than 1.4 million modern books. And when all of our operations are growing or running, that's it run, growing at about 2,000 books a day. We acquire those books through purchase from donations from libraries that are reading their collection or closing entirely and also from booksellers. Um, the, what you're seeing here is a, a photos of the unloading of a portion of a large donation of 250,000 books from Trent University in Ontario. And those materials have been digitized and made available through controlled digital lending and are available at, uh, for borrow at archive.org. So I want to talk about the controlled digital lending and the lead up to the, the release of the National Emergency Library. Um, and some of the justifications and, and decisions that we were making in that moment. Um, uh, and and we'll, it actually starts last fall. So MIT libraries approached us last fall. What you're seeing here is Hayden Library, which is the main uh, monographic home uh, for, or the, the central library on campus and the, the res uh, home of the research monographs. And Chris Berg and her librarians came to us last fall and said, Hayden Library is going to go undergo renovation next year. And the plan was for it to close at the end of last semester. So, you know, once finals were over, the library would close and the materials would be moved to an offsite uh, storage facility and they'd be largely inaccessible through the construction, which uh, was planned to run through October or September, October of this year. And so the, li the libraries approached us and said, could we use controlled digital lending to make materials available while that library, while Hayden Library is closed? And we said, yes, and here's how we can help. If you give us your MARC records, we'll run an overlap comparing your physical holdings with our digital holdings. And where there's a match, we'll give you back links to your match books. And because your books will be inaccessible, we can increase our lending count by one. So we'll have not only the one book that we've acquired and digitized to make available through controlled digital lending, but now we can also have an additional copy from the uh, copies that are in your library and that are offline. With that data, you can bring those links then back into your catalog and your users will be able to discover those resources within your local search environment. And because the Internet Archive is a nonprofit and a library, this is a non-commercial service. It costs nothing for libraries to participate. It costs nothing for patrons to borrow books. And so the uh, MIT library said that sounds great. And so the results of that uh, analysis was that we were able to find 55,000 books that the Internet Archive had already digitized so that when Hayden Library closed, and after MIT librarians, systems librarians brought those links back into their catalog, the MIT libraries community had access to those 55,000 books that were largely otherwise unavailable. And then on March 10th, we got a, a, an email, I got a message from the libraries at MIT and they said, the campus is going to close. And we are uncertain, this was a Tuesday, and they said, we're uncertain of what the library service is going to be after Saturday. Could we use controlled digital lending to make all of the MIT libraries uh, collection overlap uh, available um, while the library is closed? And we said yes. And so we ran that overlap, not, not only just over Hayden Library, but then over the entire MIT library systems from the data that they provided. And we were able to find that there were 166,000 books in common that we had already digitized. So, that was the, the MIT uh, messages that we were getting. And at the same time, then the following week is when we started seeing schools and um, libraries closing at, at national and global scale. And we were getting messages, literally dozens of messages in those earliest days of, uh, of, of the pandemic like this. So this was a teacher in, o in Ohio who said that uh, she wanted to know how many students could access one novel all at the same time because she wanted to be able to ensure that 121 students in her class could have access to California Blue by David Class and read those all at the same time. 
what's important to know about this scenario is that the school district had purchased more than 400 copies of the book. They had physical copies, but they couldn't distribute them to the students because they were locked in the school and they had vacated the school before distributing them. So the school district had purchased physical copies, yet they couldn't give them to the students. So I went and did, uh, being a librarian, went to WorldCat, did a little research about California Blue, and uh, took this screenshot of, world, uh, of the uh, results, and uh, I'm sharing it here. So you can see that uh, here in the left-hand pane that there are seven print versions of the book. There's a Braille version, and there's one ebook. California Blue was published in 1994 um, in, and then was published in a subsequent edition by um, uh, another paperback edition um, in, I believe it was 1996. California Blue is not available as a commercial EPUB. You can't go to OverDrive and download a copy. You can't go to the Kindle store. It simply doesn't exist. California Blue is only available as a commercial version in print. So that ebook that you see there in WorldCat is the copy that the Internet Archive has acquired and digitized. We sync our records with OCLC so that uh, people can discover the books that we've digitized. So just to bring this home, the, the only way that those students could access California Blue was from the, the digitized copy that the Internet Archive um, has made available. So with all of that in mind, on March 24th, the Internet Archive announced that we were suspending wait lists for our books while the world's libraries and schools were closed. And we called that effort a National Emergency Library. When we launched, we said that the National Emergency Library would run through June 30th, or the end of the US national emergency. The reason why we chose June 30th is because we wanted to get through spring semester. We wanted to get through that academic year. Our goal in releasing the National Emergency Library was to help educators and students who were disconnected from their books while their schools and their libraries were closed. A lot has been written about the National Emergency Library. You can, uh, if you haven't read it yourself, you can uh, uh, already, you can find it uh, within easy reach on Twitter or elsewhere on the web. And a question that we got a lot about the National Emergency Library was, is this controlled digital lending? And the answer is no. It's not controlled digital lending. It's close and it uses similar controls and similar infrastructure, but it's significantly different while one of those key uh, controls um, was, uh, was suspended. And that was the, the, the number, the wait list, the number of uh, own to loan ratio. Again, so that library, this library was being mobilized in response to the global pandemic. And so then uh, if it's not controlled digital lending, what is controlled digital lending? And so controlled digital lending was developed by the copyright community. It uh, comes from scholarship by uh, people like Michelle Wu at Georgetown Law, Pam Samuelson at Berkeley, Dave Hansen at Duke, Kyle Courtney at Harvard and others who were all looking at how can libraries use their print collections in our online world. And the way that controlled digital lending works is this. For a book in a library's collection, the library can decide to lend either the physical book or a scanned version of that book, but not both at the same time. The, the library needs to maintain an owned to loan ratio between the digital copies on the physical copies in hand and the digital copies on loan. For the 1.4 million books that are in our lending collection, those books that the Internet Archive has acquired and digitized, we hold a physical copy in our physical archive. Um, our physical copies don't circulate. Um, and the only thing that circulates is that digital copy that we've made, and we circulate that through controlled digital lending. And because we've scanned the book, there's no need to scan it again. And so libraries, like in the example with MIT Libraries, can, can claim that copy and lend it to their patrons where there's that uh, overlap. So some other controls um, in controlled digital lending are uh, worth mentioning here. I, I already talked about that owned to loan ratio. And so the way that it works is if there are no copies available, if all the digital copies are checked out, then a user joins a wait list and they're notified when it's their turn to read. Also, I wanna mention too, controlled digital lending is a legal framework and what we at the Internet Archive with our Open Libraries program, we've implemented a version of that framework. So we have one implementation of controlled digital lending and there are others. And we think that that's healthy actually for controlled digital lending um, as, a, 
as a library process for there to be other kinds of implementations and other libraries that are doing controlled digital lending. Um, but uh, uh, back to the to the controls. So the uh, I mentioned that if a user joins a wait list, that's how they uh, that's how they can access a copy if all the copies are checked out uh, when it's their turn. And that again, that was what was suspended uh, for the National Emergency Library. But all the other controls were in place. Um, books circulate for 14 days. So this isn't a free for all. You, you can't just go and mass download everything. You have to log in, you have to have an, an Internet Archive library card to check out a book and you can check out up to five books at a time. Um, and then those books circulate for 14 days. Um, we've added in a new feature now to have one hour loans. But at the end of your circulation and into that time period, you have to either check the book out again, or if all the copies are checked out, then join a wait list. So it's not unlimited. It's, it's based on the, the loan period. There are also another control is the digital rights management software. So our files are protected by DRM. Uh, we use Adobe Digital Editions, which is the same platform that many publishers use um, on their own uh, platforms, on their own websites to make their materials available. And the reason for using a, a, a Adobe Digital Editions in, uh, specifically and, and DRM in general is to prevent the copying or the redistribution of any of the uh, files, the encrypted files that you can download. So, users have the ability to browse the, the book online in a web browser or to download an encrypted PDF or an encrypted EPUB. And it's around those encrypted files where, uh, uh, where the, uh, the DRM takes place. So one of the main questions that we get about, uh, about controlled digital lending we get from libraries is, you know, do we have to, to do limit circulation for those books? Um, and so, you know, one of the main controls is to uh, maintain that own to loan ratio between the number of the physical copies and the digital copies lent. And so the answer is yes, circulation control is a very important part of our program. Now, how that's implemented by the library is a local library decision. That's one that the Internet Archive doesn't make, but we can give you some examples. So some libraries only put materials into controlled digital lending that are inherently non-circulating. So things that are in like a reference collection or in special collections. Some libraries are using controlled digital lending for materials that are in offsite storage, uh, like MIT libraries or, uh, um, uh, or closed branches. Um, or um, in this case uh, that we're still operating in today, um, you know, many libraries are still closed and many libraries as they're opening are looking at um, can we use controlled digital lending for no contact circulation? So there are a variety of ways that libraries can implement and use controlled digital lending. Um, uh, to, to sort of bring my, my part to a close, when I was a librarian at Washington University, when things would get stressful and, and tough, we would, um, uh, we, uh, we among our, our different you know, leadership teams or even just our work groups would say, you know, Let's, let's take a breath, folks. This is, it's just a library. And so we often would sort of reassure ourselves um, of, around the stress, uh, the, of the stress around us and say, it's just a library. Um, this isn't life or death. With the National Emergency Library, we asked for testimonials and impact statements. And we got really um, resounding feedback from, the, uh, from libraries and from students and from educators. And we got this message uh, from Benjamin, uh, who was a, a medical center librarian who told us that he used the National Emergency Library to find basic life support manuals that he was able to give to his frontline medical workers in the medical school where he worked because their physical library was closed and, and completely inaccessible. So he used the National Emergency Library to aid frontline workers. In this case, literally, it was life or death. And so the work that we all do in libraries, we understand its importance, but this particular impact message really resonated with me and it really helped um, kind of buoy our spirits um, and, and help us understand that, that the National Emergency Library was really filling an important gap in the, uh, in the information landscape over the, the, uh, the 84 days that it ran. So we closed it two weeks early on um, June 16th. Um, because we had we had always planned on bringing it was a temporary uh, library. We were always planning on bringing it down, um, and then um, uh, we were served with a uh, with a lawsuit from four from four publishers. So, 
The National Emergency Library, we believe, was an important effort. It filled the gap. We got messages from uh, the, the, the communities that we were hoping to, uh, to influence, the people who we hoped to use those materials. And we've seen now, as the National Emergency Library, now that it's closed, there's continued interest in controlled digital lending and how libraries can make their print materials available in an online environment. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for having me on the call today. I'd like to start by acknowledging that uh, both the University and the City of Edmonton are situated on Treaty 6 traditional lands of predominantly Cree peoples and also homeland of the Métis. Um, on a personal note, I'd like to say that I'm grateful that my employer has taken the TRC action plan seriously and is moving forward in that area. Uh, now, the University of Alberta Library has worked in partnership with the Internet Archive since 2008 on a few different digitization and web archiving projects. Today, I'm going to talk primarily about the University of Alberta Library's CDL pilot project with IA and how we used a little bit about how we use CDL during the initial COVID closures and how this approach can help libraries fulfill their mission of connecting the public with the work of writers and other creators, which of course is a mission that is mediated by a policy instrument that we call the Copyright Act. The University of Alberta strategic plan is titled For the Public Good and the university's promise is to uplift the whole people. Now, that's a phrase that was first used at the founding in 1908, founding of the university, and that, but that understanding of the role of a university still rings true in the culture at the University of Alberta today. And thus the decision to pilot CDL was a relatively easy one for us as it supports the library's goals of removing barriers and enabling access to collections that the U of A and Alberta taxpayers have invested in. As we all know, inaccessible hidden collections do not uplift anyone. So let's take a look at the pilot project. The historical education curriculum collection is made up of textbooks authorized for use in Alberta's elementary and secondary schools from 1885 to 1985, a bequest from the estate of Marie Watt Wiedrich wife of a professor of elementary education is being used to digitize the collection, which is now known as the Weidrich Historical Education Curriculum Collection. The print copies of these materials, which number just over 5,500, are non-circulating and stored in a secure space. Digitization of the Weidrich collection started before we considered CDL, and at that point, any materials that were already in the public domain were digitized and made openly accessible via the Internet Archive's open library. The remainder of the in, the in copyright library items were digitized but not made available at all until CDL. Today, we have 4,332 items in the collection, so a few more to be digitized. And I'd like to stress that none of them are more recent than 35 years old, making it highly unlikely that any of these titles are on publishers' front lists or, or even on their commercially viable back lists. Despite that, every single title was assessed for public domain status and if in copyright commercial availability. About a third of those titles were deemed suitable for CDL. And more than half of those CDL titles have loaned at least one, have been loaned uh, at least once since January 2019, with the total number of loans at 6,694 as of last week. For a niche collection of old K-12 school books, we think that's pretty good. That actually exceeded expectations because prior to the print, prior to digitization, the print collection was used a few times a year and accessible only by request. So looking to the future of CDL at the U of A, the Weidrich collection still has a couple of um, outstanding tasks, if you will. Digitization is underway, as I said. It should be complete in the next year. We have about 1,300 items left. Uh, at the moment, users can find those items through the Internet Archives interface, but not through our own catalog. So that's also something we need to um, finish up in the next year, hopefully. Uh, moving, moving titles into the uh, um, catalog from the Happy Trust ETAS collection has, has hopefully helped streamline some of that work. So more broadly, we would like to match the full Internet Archive collection against our library collection, as uh, Chris had mentioned, others have done. 
Um, and, uh, and while we are continuing to look for other good candidates for CDL, I need to stress that the uh, recent budget cuts at the university level have filtered down and reduced our budget digitization budget to zero in the library. So as we all know, it costs money to serve the public good. And so we're hoping that that will change in the future. But for now, the only systematic digitization program will be those that are funded other ways like the Weedrick collection. Uh, there was a minor exception to that, to that freeze. And that was the scanning of some print only titles for courses in the midst of the COVID closures during the last few weeks of the winter term primarily. In that scenario, we did attempt to purchase ebook versions before using our own digital copy. But as you might know, not all publishers are willing to sell libraries the type of ebooks or ebook access that is required for course materials, of course use. So in a few cases, a much more restricted version of CDL um, in-house was used to help students who were unable to purchase course materials in the final half of the winter semester. And as I understand it, a few titles in the spring semester, and I think we're down to one for the summer semester, so very small exceptions. So that version of CDL was basically reproducing the reserve room function of an academic library on a very, very small scale. Um, but because of budget issues related to scanning and scaling up the work especially, uh, CDL for course materials is not expected to continue into the fall term. So that is a budget decision, not a copyright risk decision. But I think given the conversation and everything that's been going on, it's probably worth talking a little bit about risk. And I need to think about mitigating risk myself. So I'd like to preface this by saying that um, from this point forward in the presentation, I'll be um, sharing my personal opinions, not necessarily, and observations really, not necessarily those of my employer. So first off, when we talk about copyright risk, uh, there are usually two things that people talk about, the risk of being sued and the risk of losing that lawsuit. And just for those of you who aren't copyright folks on the call, which I think is probably most, uh, there are exceptions to copyright infringement like fair dealing, which are intended to provide a legally defensible way to use copyright protected works if you are not the rights holder. So long as those benefits of the, the so long as the benefits of that use to the broader public interest outweigh any harms it might cause to the rights holder. Now in practice, that type of legal balancing test, which is much more flexible and appropriate than a bright line legal test, means that it's not always clear what is or what might not be considered a fair dealing or in the US fair use. So a certain amount of copyright anxiety around trying new things with new technology or even old technology at this point is to be expected. In addition, in a university setting, there are other risk factors that can further escalate a reasonable amount of anxiety and caution into copyright chill. One of those factors is reputational risk, which is often part of the risk assessment procedures at large institutions. In many cases, the reputational risks associated with a lawsuit actually outweigh the financial risks on those tools, those measurement tools. Regardless of how you get there though, copyright chill like legal chill um, which is the, uh, sorry, regardless of how you get there though, copyright chill is when defensible legal rights are not exercised because of a fear of infringement, perceived or real. So very similar to legal chill. And lawsuits have a way of flash freezing that chill. And a fear and failure of using those statutory rights can result in losing them. And that brings me to, in this context, something that I wanna talk about, mission risks. So that copyright chill can result in mission risks. The knowledge production and stewardship role of a university and its libraries is part of our contract with society. In collections work like the CDL project we just discussed, not taking any action to make an underused and relatively inaccessible collection available in digital format would force us to realize those risks associated with mission risk, those threats associated with mission risk, excuse me. Uh, put another way, when libraries do not fulfill their mandate, their users are prevented from experiencing learning opportunities that ultimately benefit society in the short and long term. In addition, libraries risk becoming less relevant and eventually perhaps even obsolete, although I know we've been hearing that since the 1910s at least. Uh, and it's libraries, not publishers, who provide perpetual access to published material so that future generations can learn from and build upon those works. 
I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that most shareholders don't really care if publishers continue to provide access to books that are no longer making a profit. And that window of profitability is um, disappearing pretty fast these days. More books than ever are being written and published in different ways. And those books are durable goods that from the consumer's point of, point of view are discretionary purchases. Those are important things to understand when we're talking about the book industry, because like it or not, the traditional book industry is mature and in decline, which is going to be tricky for authors for a little while and likely terrifying for publishers right now. Now, in a mature, declining market, it's conceivable that only one or two traditional publishers might survive, uh, especially when you consider changing demographics and the reduction in consumers' free time and money in this market in particular. Until we get there, though, we're going to see a lot more consolidation in grappling for market share and production protections. Excuse me. Now, my undergraduate degree is in commerce, so I appreciate you giving me some space here to talk about the business end of things. Um, but the first thing I learned in the first semester of business school was that making a profit is not a right. It is something you earn, and you earn that by offering the market a differentiated project that will fulfill a demand, be it existing or created. Now, from a strictly capitalist perspective, Amazon has done a really good job of that. In the process, however, it has disrupted the book market, both print and electronic. The dust is starting to settle on this, at least on the distribution front, and many publishers now have contracts with Amazon. But those contracts rose the, raised the prices of what was initially a loss leader, and, and at the end of the day, the publishers are not making more money than they did before. So that's a problem Another for them. Another problem is that traditional channels for marketing books, the brick and mortar stores, have also disappeared. So what's a publisher to do in this type of declining market? It can't take on Amazon, clearly, and this industry's market is very light on regulation, especially in the US. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but I do remember at my senior level marketing strategic management classes where you look to legal action as a, as a solution to preserve your market. And as I say, I'm not a lawyer, but it strikes me that any attempt to slow consolidation would more likely come from outside the industry. So what are you going to do? Well, you could try and sue someone who has money, but whose money you are not otherwise dependent upon. And interestingly, if you read the 60 page legal complaint filed against the Internet Archive, you will see that a lot of energy is expended differentiating the work of IA from that of circulating libraries. And perhaps even more effort is spent talking about money, but not about the money that is being lost by publishers. In fact, there is no financial calculation related to damages in the complaint. Now, I'm, you're probably wondering, why is she bringing all this up? Well, I'm bringing it up because from this librarian's perspective, it seems to me that adding a book to the open library is no different in terms of potential lost revenue to the publisher than adding a paper book to a circulating library collection or sharing it via ILL. So I'm bringing this up sort of as a speculative warning, if you will, because my colleagues are telling me that there are many, many students who rely on things like taking print textbooks out of the library on short term loan because they simply cannot afford to buy them. Especially when e-textbooks are moving to licensing models that cut out libraries and, use, and the used book markets. Now, if I ran a publishing uh, business, I'd probably want to take out the used book market too. Because after all, textbooks are how the industry is making money right now. That is pretty clear. And I can understand why they might want to protect that kind of last standing revenue stream. Uh, that's just how commerce works. So with the current state of thing, lawsuits about traditional library practices and refusing to let libraries serve underprivileged students, that makes me worry about the vulnerability of academic libraries in the years to come. To put it very bluntly, uh, and I'm probably running out of time, uh, when services like CDL are under threat, how long is it before ILL or short-term short circulating print collections are also the subject of lawsuits or perhaps lobbying efforts for legislative change to benefit shareholder gain over the public good? In my personal opinion, we need to take mission risk as seriously or perhaps even more seriously than litigation risk when we are engaging in legally defensible practices. Don't let chill reduce our footprint in society, guys. Um, but overall, what are the benefits of CDL? Just to wrap it up, I mean, 
materials that were not being used are now being accessed. So people are learning from content that they didn't have access to before. And that's a good thing. Uh, CDL has allowed us to open doors to hidden collections and increased exposure for older titles, which you know what? It's a wonderful market opportunity for those publishers. So those are my thoughts and a little bit about the U of A's CDL pilot project. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Amanda. And now we'll go over to, uh, to Christina. Thank you, Victoria. So as I get started, I would like to acknowledge that I am in Vancouver and on the unceded land of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil people. And it is Indigenous History Month. I hope that those of you listening have had an opportunity to celebrate the history, heritage, and diversity of Indigenous culture in the area where you are living. So next slide. I, I am going to talk today about why CDL matters and about the, the way that CDL is starting to be used in public libraries and what public libraries might be wanting to consider as they think about these types of projects. And then also what the CFLA committee is doing to support the expansion of CDL in Canada. And I will put this into the context of the National Emergency Library and also what has been happening with trade ebooks in Canadian public libraries over the past 10 years. Next slide. So first of all, I'm going to talk about why controlled digital lending matters. And next slide. And this is really comes down to a problem that we've been tackling in trade ebooks and in public libraries for more than 10 years. At the very beginning of this discussion, we really had some challenges with um, availability of content in Canada. So when trade ebooks started to be available on iPads and through Amazon and on e-readers, we weren't able to purchase Canadian content. Major Canadian authors like Margaret Atwood were not available to Canadian public libraries. And we put a lot of effort into changing this. Uh, and public libraries across Canada through the Canadian Urban Libraries Council talked with Canadian publishers and those major multinationals that are particularly active in Canada in order to let them know that this was a problem. There wasn't a lack of willingness to make Canadian content available to public libraries. There was a lack of awareness that, was, that it was even a problem that we couldn't buy from US distributors. So we spent a lot of time on this and things improved. So over the past five years, the, the market for trade ebook licensing in public libraries has been relatively stable. We've had perpetual access, uh, meaning that when we purchase an ebook license, although the costs have been extremely high, exceeding $100 for a book that would cost $10 or $12 for a consumer to purchase, it has at least been available. However, what we started to see in the past year is a real shift where all of the trade publishers, the major multinationals that are operating in Canada, started to move to two-year licenses. And this began with what is one of our most challenging multinational publishers, Hachette. They went from a, a, a too expensive perpetual license to a two-year license. This happened with Simon & Schuster, which is a smaller percentage of the market in Canada, um, but can, uh, certainly still a problem. We started to see embargoes on trade publications. And if you're not familiar with this trade, this concept of what a trade ebook is, trade books are the books that you find in chapters and or indigo and you find in grocery stores. And they're the things that people are buying and reading, the romance novels, the mystery novels, the stuff that gets a lot of sales for recreational reading. So this is the environment that we've been in in the past year is a sudden real shift towards temporary access to books. And this is a huge problem. So in this, in this situation, we then had COVID happen. And what that meant is that all of a sudden books were not available. And Chris was talking about the, the, the need for access through the National Emergency Library. Well, during this period of time, public libraries closed across Canada. And that's 38 million books that are no longer being borrowed by people across Canada from public libraries. 
And normally those books circulate in total more than 100 million times in a year. And we normally have more than 100 million visits to public libraries over the course of a year, which might be also accessing books on site. So none of that access was available in this period of time. The visits are not happening and the purchases the public libraries would normally do for print materials shifted to digital. And something that's really important to understand that's the distinction between the academic context and the public is that we really haven't seen the kind of shift to digital that academic environments have. So in public libraries, we're still running in the range of 75% of our use of our collections being print. So in this environment, that access was absolutely lost. And so that's why you'll be seeing that libraries are really focused on takeout services and curbside services and trying to get that access available. So, next slide. So why it matters that we have controlled digital lending and this long-term solution that goes beyond the National Emergency Library is because we have a number of problems that are being created by this ebook license environment. One of them is that the high cost of material means that we don't have a breadth of collection. We don't have, uh, because of timed and metered licenses, we have reduced preservation. And we don't have the long-term access to collections that are local in our public libraries anymore. We can't rely on knowing that if we bought a book that was published in our region, that it will still be there in 10 years or 20 years. And that has been a role of a lot of, a lot of large urban libraries and a lot of small municipal libraries to preserve the writing of their own communities. And then we have a problem of exclusivity and embargoes, so, which is creating a real lack of equity. And this is particularly something we're seeing as a huge problem from Amazon and Audible, where Amazon uh, Audible licenses content from Canadian authors and Canadian publishers and makes it available only through their platform and therefore not to Canadian public library users. So uh, really significant as an issue that we need to solve. Next slide. So I'm now going to talk about the context for controlled digital lending in public libraries. And this is necessary because we need to take alternative solutions to the problems of access. 10 years of work on ebook licensing has not moved us ultimately forward. We have slightly more content available, but in much less sustainable ways. Next slide. And so we have a couple of libraries there that, that are just starting out with controlled digital lending. And the one that's really leading the way is Hamilton Public Library. So they have signed up for Open, uh, open Library and they've matched 54,000 of their print books with digital. And another Ontario library, at Milton Public Library has done the same. So we are taking a relatively cautious start. At Vancouver Public Library, we're looking at this as well. And what, uh, the way that, that these libraries are thinking about the process is they're letting their patrons know that they can sign up for Open Library and that it's the patron's choice. So the library is providing a link, they're providing that vehicle to sign up, but they are not really providing the access themselves. And what they have learned through this access is that Open Library and the controlled digital lending solutions that we have right now don't replace the kind of reading that people do in a public library. They're not solutions for recreational reading. So the big questions that come up from patrons are why people don't have the kinds of choices of format that they do when they access public library collections through Overdrive or through RB Digital or through one of the other ebook solutions that we have in public libraries. They want to read on their iPad or on their ebook e reader curled up in the corner of their couch or out in their garden and that the experience of open library is much more like an academic uh, ebook access experience. So we can see that this is not replacing the recreational reading so much as it acts as a solution when other access isn't there. And Something that Hamilton Public Library has done, and I'd like to thank Paul Takala for this, is sought a legal opinion and made that available to other Canadian public libraries. So I'll talk about that next. So next slide. So the legal opinion looks at what, uh, what libraries might want to consider as far as risk management. 
And Amanda talked about this concept of risk quite a bit. So the legal opinion is available to public libraries and it, uh, it is important to understand that it's a resource and a reference point. And it is something where you in an individual library need to also get your own legal opinion and consider your own circumstances and what you might be thinking of including in a collection. So what this opinion looks at is the situation of controlled digital lending. And Chris has covered all of the elements that need to be in place for that. And then considers what collections a public library might have that they might want to consider digitizing. And so public domain materials can clearly be included in any digitization project. Then we have current copyrighted material, which the opinion recommends excluding from any digitization project. And so that is really about things that have an existing ebook license available from a publisher and their current content. So if it was on the bestseller list and it's published in the past five years, it's quite a high risk of not meeting the fair dealing tests and therefore not being a good idea to include in any digitization project. The, this is really comes down to the, um, the market impact on the work. And it would be hard to make an argument that there wasn't a high market impact on current copyrighted material that is being sold right now. And then we have old copyrighted material. And old copyrighted material is the place where we have a lot of space to consider what it is we hold in public libraries that would make sense to make available. And this is really the place where we can start to address the problems that are created by the ebook license model that we have now. So we have ebook licenses that are available for content that was published in the past two years, but we have nothing that's available for content that was published more than 10 years ago. And so what we see as a consequence is gaps in our um, availability of series uh, and in those popular areas people want to read. And we also have collections of local content that may go back 50 years that we've taken, made this effort to preserve and those publishers may no longer be in business. It may be hard to figure out who they, uh, how, to, who holds the rights to that content. And it's content that we know there's interest in at a local level for a research purpose. So, so this is the area that there seems to be a real opportunity that each of us in public libraries look for ways to make our local content available. And it supports uh, interlibrary loan needs in ways that are, have, be, have begun to feel quite cumbersome in a digital environment. So next slide. So for Hamilton Public Library, what, uh, what they have considered is along with their participation in open library, they have a children's book collection that really fits into that framework of a special collection of historical material. And they are digitizing material that is older than 20 years. So that's, um, that's the, the type of content that they have, have started with for their digitization. And finally, I'll just talk briefly about what we're doing on the CFLA committee, very briefly, as I know we're short on time. So next slide. We have a CFLA committee of both academic and public librarians that are working on a, a number of things to support people's effort around CDL in Canada. Next slide. And so those things are a white paper that will be specific to the Canadian context. So thinking about that white paper that David Hansen and Kyle Courtney created for the US fair use environment, we'll look at this under the context of fair dealing. We are working on a risk framework that will help uh, libraries to see what they might want to consider in selecting a collection. And some of those considerations being commercial availability, who you're lending to, the control of access of the original print copies and understanding the rights holder. And then we'll also provide case studies for libraries that are, are working on projects in Canada. And we are also at the moment, because of the National Emergency Library lawsuit, thinking about a statement emphasizing the importance of access through resources like the Internet Archive and the goals of the Internet Archive that are consistent with the goals of libraries. So thank you very much. And I think that I'll hand this back over to Victoria and Mark, I believe, for questions.